Okay, so then this should be uh, the last applications of derivatives meeting. So we can do integration on the next uh, session 40, but of course I don't count the tutorials uh, in the numbered sessions, so that will be next week. Uh, so to finish off, I just want to do a cluster of problems related to limits at infinity, kind of the last thing that we did to lock that in, and then we'll be hopefully ready to move on. So the first interesting thing to start things off is a nice Harvard-MIT math tournament problem. So this is going to be a, something you can massage into a form that one can use L'Hopital to solve. So the limit we're given is the limit as x approaches 1 of x raised to the power of x over sine 1 minus x. So it looks very complicated, but the usual trick with limits like this that involve uh, x-dependent bases and x-dependent exponents is to use logarithms to pull down exponents and uh, try to massage it into a form that either is like a 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, because we proved L'Hopital for those. So I will ask you, what should we do to tackle this bad boy? So should we just set it equal to some L? Because to take logs, I believe we need to, well, have it set equal to something. Yeah, that's fair. So I guess there's two ways to do it. You could either say, as you said, set the entire limit x to the x over sine 1 minus x. So we could set this whole thing equal to some number l, and then take logs of both sides. And then if we do that, we just need to put in some words to explain why we can move the log past the limit. And the reason you could do that is by continuity. So um, I don't know if we've actually proven this yet, but log is... Uh, differentiable, therefore continuous, and continuous functions commute with limits. So you could either do that. Another way to do it is instead to start by defining a new variable, which is the junk inside the limit, this x to the power x over sine 1 minus x. So before taking the limit, then just write log of y as something, and then take limits at the end there. So either of these ways work. You could do whichever you prefer, but um, maybe we should do this one since this was your suggestion. So if we do that, then what should the next step be? I am really hating this sump pump, like the thing, but thinking. So I guess we are in log with, I don't think we need to talk about base because we're assuming that this is base E. Yes. So we see just by taking the log of each side that this is going to the left side is going to be equal to the limit of x over sine 1 minus x times log x. Sine 1 minus x, good, log x. And all that chunk is still x goes to 1. And I guess that's log l, you say? Okay, so what can we do with this junk inside the brackets then? Thinking. Maybe I'll just clean up algebra a little bit and put the log in the top since uh, there we go it makes things look a little nicer so I am I think as x goes to 1 it would seem that both the top and bottom go to zero, but that is just a thought, not proof. 
Yeah, I think that's true, since uh, the top... Well, actually, we could prove that if you wanted. We know the limit as x goes to 1 of x is 1, the limit as x goes to 1 of log x is 0, because log 1 is 0 and log is continuous. The bottom sine 0 is 0 and sine is continuous, so indeed this thing goes to 0 over 0, which is one of the, the various orgy of variations of L'Hopital's rule that we have. So I think we could actually just apply L'Hopital to this expression now. Right. Okay. So we can simply say that this is equal to 1 over log x over, and we are going to be applying chain rule to sine to get. Wait, what did you say the top was? 1 over log x? Excuse me, 1 over x. 1 over x. Don't we need to product rule this thing in the top? Oh, right, because we're different. Right. X is not constant yet. I said yet. Yet. <laughs> Eventually <laughs> it will be. So we see that we're going to get 1 times, yeah, 1 times log x plus x over x. Right, x times derivative of log x. My pen is breaking, but there we go. Okay, so you say 1 times... I don't know why I said x over x, I apologize. That's fine. Yeah, x, x over x is what you would get first if you differentiated this thing before simplifying. So yeah, that go, that guy becomes a 1. And then what about the bottom? The bottom is going to be by the chain rule. Cosine of 1, of one minus x times negative 1. Good. Okay. And now I think we can just evaluate this limit. This is a quotient of continuous functions, neither of which vanish, and we've proven that that is equal to the quotient of the limits of the top and bottom. So what do we get for this guy? So we're going to have 0 plus 1 over 1 times negative 1. So it ends up just being negative 1. Good. So now if we're almost done, I've made this very circular line of equations, but these are of course equal, so oh, not like that. I want to <laughs> make the log equal to this thing. So the last thing we want to do is to back out what was the original thing L, because this negative one is log L, but that's pretty easy to solve, so when you invert that, what do we get for L? So we have that for log L equal to negative one, let me think. trying to remember. Hey. Well, I think there's this definition that if... Oh, it just means that the log of... Well, so the log of the limit is equal to negative one, let me think. Uh, yeah, I mean, all we're doing, I mean, this... How do you how do you solve this equation for L? <laughs> right. Oh my god, I think it's e to the negative one. Yeah, it should be E inverse. <sighs> Why? Good. So kind of surprising, because when you look at this limit, nothing about this seems to scream out that E should be involved. I mean you have this iterated exponential with a sign somehow, so the fact that E emerges, or in particular 1 over E, seems a bit mysterious to me, so it's kind of an interesting limit, but indeed. E you, could do this, hmm? you could do this with any base log, correct? Uh, yes, but then you would get an extra factor here, because in our, in by using L'Hopital's rule, uh, right. we took the derivative, and the equation ddx log x equals 1 over x is only true for base e, only true for base e. So you get an extra factor if you used a different base. Okay. Good. Uh, okay, let's make sure we, uh, make sure we got that right. So indeed, take logs. Uh, we proved L'Hopital for 0 over 0 at a. Differentiate top and bottom, get log x plus 1 over minus cos 1 minus x, which is minus 1, and then use uh, exponentiate both sides to find that the desired limit uh, is 1 over e, or e inverse. Good, cute problem. Uh, thoughts on this problem?
I have no thoughts on this. Good. Okay. So here's an example. I guess I'll alternate between solving problems for you and working them out together. So this is another problem out of the AOPS book. So remember last time we had this example of x squared plus x minus x, limit as x goes to infinity, and we solved that by multiplying top and bottom by the conjugate and using L'Hopital. So you might, after seeing that problem, you might ask the question, is there a general way whenever you have two functions which both tend to infinity as x goes to infinity, so say limit as x goes to infinity of f is infinity, and also limit as x goes to infinity of g equals infinity, you might ask, is there a general way to use L'Hopital for quote-unquote infinity minus infinity, right? The difference of these two things that are getting large. Uh, and the answer is actually no, there's not a general rule that always works, but this problem asks uh, the reader to propose a method that might work some of the time. So this is the method which works some of the time. You take the limiting expression, which looks like infinity minus infinity. We want to make this look like a fraction to use L'Hopital. So you divide top and bottom. This is really, you know, f minus g over 1. So you divide top and bottom by f times g. So in the top, we get f over f times g, which is just 1 over g, minus g over f times g, which is just 1 over f. In the bottom, we get 1 over f times g. Then you say, aha, since f and g both go to infinity, 1 over g and 1 over f both go to 0. So top goes to 0, 1 over fg goes to 0, so top and bottom go to 0, and we can use the good old-fashioned L'Hopital for 0 over 0 at infinity. If you do that, then you have to take a fairly messy set of derivatives, so you differentiate top and bottom, use the well, whatever your favorite way of differentiating 1 over g is, either the power rule with the chain rule for the power being g to the minus 1, or the quotient rule, or whatever. You do that in the top and bottom, and then you can simplify by multiplying through, basically undoing what we did before. You multiply top and bottom by f squared g squared to clear denominators. So if you do that, kills this bottom. Uh, this becomes an f squared. This becomes a g squared. Kill that. And then we get this expression, f squared g prime minus g squared f prime over fg prime plus gf prime. So the reason I said that this doesn't always work is because at the end of the day, depending on what f and g are, this thing might not exist, or it might require another application of L'Hopital's rule, or it, it might just be junk, it might give you nothing. So infinity minus infinity is much harder to deal with, but this at least gives you something to try if you are handed to f and g that go to infinity and want to find their, their limit like this. So, okay, just something to be aware of, a nice trick. Uh, thoughts or questions on the trick? Do we also assume that f and g are, um, that you can actually take the derivative of f and g? Oh, yes, good. I should have said f and g must also be differentiable if this method is to work. Yes, good. Somehow I omitted that from my assumptions. Good. Good, good, good. Other thoughts? I have no thoughts. Okay, let's bang out another problem then. So here's a nice fun limit. Um, so suppose we have four numbers that are all positive. A, B, X, and Y are all greater than zero, strictly greater than zero. And we know a and b sum to 1, so a plus b equals 1. Now we're asked, compute the limit as t goes to 0 from above of this strange averaging thing. You take a times x to the power t plus b times y to the power t and raise that whole thing to the 1 over t power. So I don't know, what ideas do you have to tackle something like this? Literally, as soon as I turn on my mic, the jet of water happens again. So much. Uh, let's see. Could we potentially take the log again? Yeah. Seems. Okay. Seems like it might work. Uh, I guess... Let's see. I believe that we are still in the phase of applying L'Hopital. Yeah, I think that's so, the strategy. So, just like last time, I believe that we can let this be equal to some L and 
see that this is slightly harder due to the complex terms inside. Yeah, we could go step by step though. So if I just take the first thing, so again, we use this argument that I can move the log past the limit because log is continuous and the thing inside is continuous. So, well, I'll, I'll leave some space there, but uh, when I take the log of this whole inside junk, just what's the first step you would do to simplify that? We are going to have, first of all, a 1 over t in, in front of the log. And I'm thinking how to handle the log of axt plus byt. Do we have any rules for the log of a sum of two numbers? I do not recall any. No, we don't. Yeah, so we're fucked. You can't simplify this further. So we better hope that somehow we can apply a version of Lafatal to this without simplifying the log of a sum, because we don't know how to do that. But what happens to the top and bottom, if I think of this as log junk is in the top and t is in the bottom, what happens as t goes to zero from above? So if t goes to zero from above, we see that if this is written as if t is under everything, the bottom goes to zero, and it would seem that the top goes to one plus one-ish. Uh, well, let's see, the top goes to log of a x to the a zero plus b, plus b right. y to the zero, but a plus b equals one, right? So I think that's log of one, which is zero. Whoa, okay, that makes more sense. <laughs> See, the whole it thing breaks really. if you don't have that. <laughs> you need the a plus b equals 1. Uh, okay, good. So that sounds nice. Then we can, I, th I think, Lapital this guy again. So what happens if I Lapital top and bottom here? So we are going to have, I believe by the chain rule here, 1 over ax t plus byt. I'm not saying to the power of t, because that takes time. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Times. Be careful I'm... here. Okay. Oh, fuck. Nice. There we go. Got it back. I believe... We are deriving with respect to T, no. Yeah, right. I can't tell. Good. Okay, That's yeah, good. with respect to T. Yeah, Lafayette tells you to differentiate with respect to the limiting variable, but do you remember okay. if, so X is a constant now, this is the tricky thing. Don't differentiate with respect to X, X is just a number. So do you remember right. if, if c is a constant, I'm going to use c instead of x so we don't get confused in the sidebar, but if c is a constant, do you remember what is the derivative with respect to t of that constant raised to the power t? Do you remember that? I do not remember this. Damn it. Uh, don't, it's not the power rule. No, it's not. This is trickier. Power rule only right. works for variable base and a constant exponent. This is constant right. base, variable exponent. Remember, this was one of the, when, when I presented this proof, I said, this is a bullshit detector. If someone claims to know calculus, you ask them to differentiate C to the T. And if they power rule it, you know they don't know what they're doing. So let's not be that person. Um, but what we can do is use the log trick. Remember, I claimed that if you ever want to take a derivative of a function with a variable in the exponent, you should first take the log of both sides of the equation and then take the derivative of that guy and solve for f prime. So what would that give us? Okay, so in this case we're going to see that the derivative of axt, so we can take the log of it to get t times log ax equals some log L sub A, I'll call it. Well, hold on. Let's just do the sidebar. Let's let's solve the problem on the right and then go back to the problem on the left. So okay. we're trying to find what is f prime of t, and then we'll use that to get the derivative of this thing. 
So I did the first step. So I took the log of both sides. And then what happens when I differentiate this equation? Differentiating that equation with respect to t gets you log c equals 1 over f. Don't forget to chain rule. Whatever F right. is. F is something special. Just going to be <laughs> F's a function. T prime. F prime. Right. Derivative of F with respect to T. Good. So that means F prime is F log C. Or plugging back in the definition of F, the derivative is C to the T log C. So now we can go back to the problem at hand, because now we know how to take the derivative of ax to the t, where now the, we're differentiating with respect to t. So using this result, that the derivative of a constant raised to the power t is that constant to the power t times the log of the constant, what would we write down for the derivative of the inside junk here? So, I... Yes, we can start by product ruling AXT for A times XT, of course. I don't think we need product rule because A is a constant. Yeah. We could just pull out the right. constant. Right. So this is, well, I'll write XT one more. XT is going to be XT times log X. Yeah, A X to the power A times two. log X log x. Good. Okay. Same thing for the second term. What do we get there? So this is going to be byt log y. Good. Log y. Okay. And bottom's pretty easy. What's the derivative of the bottom? I think that the derivative of the bottom is, let's see, 1. 1. Very nice. Whoa. Okay. So now what? Can we evaluate this limit now? Let's see. So the top is going to go to whatever. Let's see. I'm looking at the foremost term here. Why does this thing exist? The pump I, I want to die. Why do you stay in the basement all day if that's that sound is going to irritate you intermittently? I don't get to stay in the basement all day anymore. I have things going on. Ah, uh, what a shame. Must be a real person. So 1 over a plus b is going to be 1 over 1, so that goes to 1. Uh, wait. The second term is going to be... Why am I trying so hard to think? Okay. For, for t as it goes to 0 is going to be a log x. Well, are we having this all in parentheses? Because it... Because, um... You said this thing goes to 1, right? And that's multiplying this right. in parentheses, right? It is? Well, it looks like I forgot to close the yeah. final parentheses. Okay. But yeah. Okay. I see now. Times x plus b log y, I believe the pattern is. Looks good. So a log x plus b log y. So now we can just evaluate that, So because uh, this limit is totally well determined. So now all we have to do is solve for L. So what we found by that whole exercise was log of L, where L is the thing we want to find, the limit of interest. Log L is A log X plus B log Y. So what is L then? All right, so L is going to be equal to E t is it going to be e to the power of a log x plus b log y? Well, yeah, but we know how to simplify that, right? e to the power a log x plus 
b log y. I mean, we know. So log, well, e to the power of some log is e to the a times x. Uh, well, hold on. Let's. I mean, well, we have to that this is e I'm... to the log of something, right? Hmm. How do I express this exponent as that... a log of one thing? I'm trying to figure out how to handle the A in front. Well, I mean, I think we have a rule for that. We just put put it in here, right? Oh, my god. Right. This is log of a power, right? Right. Good. So this is just going to be x to the A and y to the B? Yeah, good. So x to the A and then times y to the B. Good, so again, that's kind of surprising. Uh, t going to zero from above of this expression, where a and b are multiplying x and y raised to various powers. Somehow when we take a limit as t goes to zero from above, this thing is computing x raised to the power a and y raised to the power b in this very mysterious way. So, um, yeah, it was interesting. It required an application of Lopatel's rule, but it was, I think everything we did was basically Correct. Uh, in, in my solution, I chose to call it z. Take logs. You get the log of this junk over t. Use L'Hopital. Don't forget this thing. The derivative of c to the t is c to the t log c. Uh, you get this junk. Now this is eminently computable because we can simply ten send t to zero because top and bottom are continuous and finite. So we get, as you said, a log x plus b log y, which is log of x to the a, y to the b. And at the end of the day, undoing the logs on both sides, that gives us x to the a, y to the b for the limit of interest. Good. I think that's fun. Thoughts on the fun limit? Of course, I muted myself immediately before I said it and made it impossible to get it back. Uh, I have no thoughts. <laughs> Okie dokie. Good. Uh, Alright, so this uh, this next act is like an extended problem. This is actually taken from one of the AOPS calc uh, problem sets where they had this like three-part problem about little o notation. So we'll just grind through that problem, but first I wanted to motivate what little o notation is. We discussed it briefly a while ago in like a little preview, but um, this is, damn it, this is one of two common notations used in computer science for denoting asymptotic time complexity, right? So this was something, something we discussed a while ago that if you have, I don't know, some function, uh, I don't know what to call it, t of n, which measures the time it takes for a program to run on an input of size n. So a program to run on, say, n. This could be, for instance, a program which sorts a list from smallest to largest, like a list of integers, and n is the length of the list. So you could ask, as I make the length of the list longer and longer, how does the time it takes for my program to run scale with n? And when n is small, that function will be very complicated because it might depend on some, you know, random features about uh, the particular numbers in your list and you know whether how many swaps were necessary in order to sort it but as n gets very large those sort of subleading or less dominant effects kind of die out so computer scientists tend to only care about the behavior on the time it takes the program to run in the limit as n gets large so there's a few ways to describe or to compare the growth of two functions in the limit as their inputs get large um, the simpler one, but actually the less common one to use in theoretical CS courses, is little o notation. There's also big no o notation, which requires limit supremum to define, so I'm not going to do that. But here's the definition of little o notation. Good, so okay, definition. Let f be a real valued function. You could think of f as this t of n if you'd like. I'm just going to write it as f instead of t. We defined the set o of f. Little o of f is a set of functions. And in particular, it is the set of all functions g with the property that the limit as x goes to infinity of g of x divided by f of x equals zero. So this is the set of all functions roughly that grow uh, more slowly, much more slowly than the function f defining the set, right? Because if g grows much more slowly than f, f gets huge, then this fraction is going to get very small because the bottom's huge and the top is not so huge, which means the fraction should tend to zero. So this is actually just 
a new fancy word to drape around something we've already seen before, right? Because uh, we already have a word for this thing in, inside the, the set. This is the statement that f dominates g, right? We already defined this. We say f dominates g if this limit is zero. So, uh, huge. It's getting huge faster. Uh, good. So, if you prefer, you can say that little o of f is the set of all functions that are dominated by f. Okay, fine. So, uh, it's not so bad. But let's try to prove some properties of this set definition. So, this is some sloppy notation that I don't actually like, but people actually write this, so I'll, I'll use it and then just explain what it means. So, we wish to prove that o of f o of g is a subset of o f g. So, this, I, I don't, here's why I don't like this notation. Why? Because o of f is a set. As we saw, it's a set of all func uh, functions dominated by f. O of g is a set. And I've written these two things next to each other, O of f times O of g, as though we know how to multiply two sets. There is no definition for a way to multiply two sets. So this is just sloppy, you know, notation between friends, like, oh, you know what I mean when I write this. People do this, and it's not very precise. But what this notation actually means is that if you have a first function, say h1, which is in the first set, O of f, and you have a second function, h2, which is in the second set, O of g, then the product of those two functions, h1, h2, is in the set on the right, O of f, O of g. So if I were writing this very precisely, I would have, instead of written, instead of writing O of f, O of g, uh, I should have really written this as O of f, O of g, is defined as uh, the set of all products of functions h1 times h2 such that h1 is in the first set, O of f, and h2 is in the second set, O of g. So again, the notation doesn't really make sense because you can't multiply sets, but if you write this you know, in a casual context, maybe the reader knows what you're talking about, you don't really mean the product of the sets, you mean the product of all functions where one function is in the first set, and the other function is in the second set. So that's what that means, but it's a little, it's a little bad. Okay, so if we wanted to prove this, that if h1 is in the first and h2 is in the second, then their product is in the right side, where should we start? What should we do? I guess we can... Oh, before we actually start, could you use a cup instead of whatever that is? A cup? Well, definition. Oh, like a union? Yeah. Uh, union wouldn't quite be right, because the union is the set of all functions in the first guy and all the functions in the second guy. I don't mean all functions in the first guy and functions in the second guy. I mean all products of functions in the first guy and second guy not just take everything in the first bucket and dump it in the second bucket. I mean, take out one thing from the first bucket and multiply it by something in the second bucket. That's different from cup. Okay. Thinking, as I move my chair forwards. I wondered what that creak was. Necessary, um, let's see. I have not worked with sets or strange definitions in a while. <laughs> well, let's start with maybe the definitions. Maybe we should write down uh, the definitions of the things we have, the two assumptions. So we assume this and this. So let's just convert those two things into definitions and then convert the thing we want to prove into definitions and see if we can massage the haves into the wants. So what, are the, what is the meaning of the two statements we have? So, h1 in little o of f means that h1 is some function mm -hmm. such that it is, well, such that it dominates f? I think it's a function which is dominated by f, right? So, if h1 okay. belongs to this guy, then that means the limit uh, of h1 over f is zero, right? Okay. 
good. So what equation should I write to express these two pink underlined things? So I believe that we can write down H1, excuse me, um, H1 over F, excuse me, I need to think about this like three more seconds. And now there's random clicking in the background. I hope it's not a bomb. It's a beam. That's concerning, regardless. Okay. So, why? <laughs> uh, this is my life now. Okay. So I believe H1 over F is going to be equal to zero equals h2 over g. Uh, well, they're not equal to zero, but the limit goes equals zero, right? OK, yeah. As x, yep, as x goes to infinity equals zero equals limit as x goes to infinity of h2 over g. OK, good. So those are the two pink underlined statements. What is the statement we want to prove expressed as? This is the statement that The limit as x goes to infinity of h1 times h2 is, well, over fg equals 0. Good, fg equals 0. OK. So do you see a one-line argument for why, if these two things are true, then this third thing must be true? Could we multiply them? Yes, because we have proven that if, li if a limit exists, then the limit of the product is the product of the limits. So the thing which we want to be equal to 0, h1 times h2 over fg, is indeed exactly the same as what you would get by the product of the limits of these two things, since they exist. Again, we can only do this because we've assumed that the limits exist. We proved before that if the limits don't exist, you can't split them like this. Good, but that's 0 times 0, which is what we wanted it to be, 0. OK, so this is not a hard exercise. It's just a reading comprehension exercise to see whether you can understand what the definitions mean. OK, thoughts on this question? That was easy. Good. I need an easy button. I need to, I can. I actually have one of those, a Staples easy button in my parents' house. Uh, Good, yeah, so this is just the same thing again. Uh, this is unpacking those two definitions. This limit vanishes, this limit vanishes by definition. Uh, the limit of the product is the product of the limits. So this thing is this 0 times 0, which is 0. But again, this is the definition of h1, h2 belonging to the set O of fg. OK, let's do something a bit more interesting. So if f is a polynomial and g of x is e to the x, prove that f belongs to O of G. So what what do we need to show for this statement to be true? So we want to show that F, excuse me, the limit as X goes to infinity of F over G equals zero. Yeah, F of X over G, but G is E to the X. So we want this to be zero. OK. So how could we prove this statement? Or if, how could we prove that this is true for any polynomial? Muted myself so that you don't need to listen to water jet noises. Let's see. How considerate of you. I am thinking about whether or not we need to work from the definition of polynomial. We could do that, yeah. So maybe I should put in explicitly polynomial means it's some sum of, of a finite sum of monomials. So any polynomial can be written as a n x to the n plus a n minus one x to the n minus one plus a dot 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 plus a zero, and we still want this all to be over e to the x. Okay, so that's our definition. Um, right now, it looks like we proved last time that this top guy is always going to go to infinity, right? Because we proved that right. x to the n goes to infinity, 
but we also have this nice thing we proved L'Hopital for infinity over infinity at infinity. This was a real bitch to prove, but we proved it two sessions ago. So, what could we do with this guy? Wait, what if the leading term is negative? Ah, so then this will go to... Well, we'll, we'll see what happens. If the leading term, if an is negative, then the top goes to minus infinity, but then you can pull out a minus sign, and then this will be minus the limit of something that looks like infinity over infinity. So, in fact, you could actually use that argument to prove a version of L'Hopital for minus infinity over infinity if you wanted. Uh, the reason I didn't show you that proof is because it's really one line. The one line is says it says factor out a minus sign and then apply the old one, <laughs> right? Because it's now it's just infinity over infinity. So uh, yeah, I probably should have explained that. But the punchline is that even if a n is negative, we can still pull out a minus sign so this looks like infinity over infinity and then use the the old guy. Okay. Well, lovely. We can apply a lot. It's all. I wonder how. <laughs> Good. Well, what happens on the first round of L'Hopital? On the first round of L'Hopital, it becomes a n times n x to the power of n minus 1. Good. A n, well, a yeah. n, excuse me, a n minus, yeah. That thing. <laughs> I think you said a n minus 1 first, but yeah, that's, that's the same thing as what you just said. Good. Yeah. And then I'm not going to write the rest of these, but the last one goes to zero. What happens in the bottom? And this is still e to the x because magic. Yes, this is the magic of e to the x. OK, well, that's great. There's two possibilities after we do this. Either n was 1, so now this is a constant over e to the x, or else n was greater than 1, which means this is another polynomial that goes to infinity at infinity. And we can apply L'Hopital again. But it's pretty easy to see that if you just do this over and over, eventually we're going to get what in the numerator and what in the denominator. I believe we are eventually going to get something, I think. A, okay, thinking about the form. You know, eventually all these guys are going to die, right? And then, right. <laughs> and then this we're guy... We're all going to die. Okay, well, yes, we're, we are all doomed. But eventually we're going to get to the point where this, this is just x, and then we take the derivative of a n x and just get left with a n, right? Oh, that makes much more sense. Yeah. I was like... Are you gonna hit? I was thinking about how to write down the a n times a n minus one or whatever. Yeah, I mean, you could keep all these terms, but yeah. eventually they're all gonna die, so it doesn't matter. Um, good. So eventually you get here. Once you get here, you can't use L'Hopital anymore because top and bottom don't both go to infinity, right? This is just a constant. He doesn't go anywhere. He stays at a n as x goes to infinity. But this guy goes to infinity, so we know there's a very nice number, which is the number that something goes to if it's one over something which goes to infinity <laughs> and uh what is what is this number i think it's zero i think it is zero as well good so i think we did actually yeah we proved this was a lemma that we proved two sessions ago when we were on the way to proving l'hopital for infinity over infinity at infinity i think i said like this is a very silly lemma but i'm going to prove it anyway that one over something which goes to infinity must go to zero so, good, okay. Um, I think that works, which is what we wanted to show, right? To show that g dominates any polynomial, you have to show that the limit of their ratio goes to zero. And I think we've done that. I was a little kind of sloppy here about this. I mean, if, if I were grading for real analysis one and a student wrote this in like the formal proof they were handing in where they just said, okay, keep going until you get down to a n, I might say, all right, that's a little sloppy. If we were being totally rigorous, what I would probably do is use induction, mathematical induction on the order of the polynomial. So remember, for induction, you start with the base case. So I would say we're going to start with zeroth order polynomials, which are just constants. 
right, and a constant over e to the x, limit x goes to infinity, equals zero, and then I would say, all right, this is how induction works. You prove that if it works for n, it works for n plus one. So I would say, all right, now suppose that this guy is some n plus one order polynomial in the top, blah, 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 and then apply L'Hopital rule, L'Hopital's rule, and then I would have a n plus one, n plus one, x to the n plus junk over e to the x, and I would say, well, by our inductive step, it works for n, and we've proven that if it works for n, it works for n plus one, therefore it works for all orders of polynomials by induction. So that's what I would write if I were uh, if I were in a class and I was afraid that the grader would believe that I didn't understand the argument, but uh, I think fine between friends we understand that uh, we could write that proof if really we really had to, so we're just going to be a little hand wavy here. And the hand waviness is just saying keep applying L'Hopital until the polynomial is flattened to a constant, where flattened really means it's shorthand for this more correct argument, but to take enough derivatives and it hits a constant. And once it hits a constant, we know that this limit will be zero. Okay, good. Thoughts on little o challenge two? You're already on slide 14. I am. I think it's going to be a short meeting today. For some reason, I thought these problems would take longer, but I misjudged. Okay, let's do one more pretty easy just unraveling the definitions proof. Um, okay, so this time we would like to prove that O of O of F is a subset of O of F. And again, this is sloppy notation because our definition of O of something means that the thing in the parentheses, the thing you are taking the O of, is supposed to be a function, right? But as I've written it here, we are asked to take O of O of F, and O of F is a set, not a function. What does it mean to take O of a set? So again, this is sloppy notation, but computer scientists write it, so I should explain what it means. Uh, when you write O of O of F, you really mean the set of all functions that are dominated by a function in O of F. So in other words, this is the set of all, uh, I guess, H2 such that uh, how am I supposed to write this? The set of all H2 such that, uh, maybe I should have a for all in here. Well, okay, maybe let me say this sentence and then write it in set form. So what this is supposed to mean is that if you have a function H1, which is in O of F, so H1 is dominated by F, and H2 is dominated by uh, H1, then h2 is also dominated by f. So this, I guess, should write as a set of all h2 such that the limit, uh, I'm gonna run out of space now. Man, I should have thought this through more carefully, but okay, this is a statement that, or the set of all functions h2 such that uh, for all h1 with limit x goes to infinity of h1 over f equals zero. It's also true that the limit as x goes to infinity of h2 over h1 equals zero. I'm not explaining this well, but th this is the way to understand it. What we want to prove is that if h1 is in O of f, so that's the thing in the innermost parentheses, and h2 is dominated by h1, we would like to prove that h2 is dominated by f, which is expressed by this set notation. Okay, I'm going to stop butchering this explanation and just ask, uh, what do you think we should do? Okay, we start by what we're given. So h1 is in subset of little o of f implies that the limit as x goes to infinity of h1 over f equals zero, and I'm just going by variable names. Similarly, with the, the limp, the, yeah. This is also equal to h of, excuse me, limit of, 
limit as x goes to infinity of h of 2 over h of 1. Good. OK, so we know those things. And what do we want to prove? We want to prove that the limit as x goes to infinity of h2 over f equals 0. Good. OK, now can you see a one-line <laughs> reason why, uh, if this is true, then this must be true? I wonder if we should multiply. I think so. What happens when we multiply? So we see since the numerator of our former, well, these are both defined to be true limits since we see that they equal zero by definition. Mm -hmm. So what we see due to the numerator of our former and denominator, denominator of our latter, we're going to just get that the product of limits is, well, product of limits is equal to what we want to prove. Okay, so you say, since both limits exist, we can take the product, and that's the product of the limits, but the product of the limits, as you said, gets a nice cancellation. So we have numerator and denominator are both h1, so we'll have an h1 over f times an h2 over h1, and we'll have this nice cancellation of the h1s. So this is the limit as x goes to infinity of h2 over f, but on the other hand, we know the value of this thing, both of these guys are zero. So we know that the limit on the right also exists, ooh, Team Fortress. The limit on the right also exists and equals zero. So indeed, just taking the product of these two tells us that uh, th this is a sentence which sounds almost obvious when you say it in words, but uh, so if h1 is dominated by f, so h1 grows much more slowly than f, and h2 grows much more slowly than h1, then h2 grows much more slowly than f, right? It's almost obvious, right? Because the property of growing much more slowly than another function should be transitive. If, if I'm much slower than you and you're much slower than, I don't know, some cross-country boy, then I'm much slower than the cross-country boy by transitivity. But, okay, good, so it's good to prove. Um, yeah. Uh, Short proof. I don't think I even wrote out the cancellation when you multiply them, but this is basically what you just said. Yeah. Both limits are zero. Multiply them. Cancellation. Get the desired ratio tends to zero as well. Domination soldier. Interesting. Okay. Other thoughts on domination? I heard that giggle. <laughs> 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 uh, oh, why? I cannot take my life seriously. What? What do you say? I don't know why I keep sending like random references that I come up with as you say things. Uh, I don't know. Well, I mean, I enjoy the references, but I'm wondering why you send them instead of saying them. Well, I guess you can't say this link, so that makes sense. Yeah, sound clips are necessary. No, I enjoy this. It uh, makes it more fun. Okay. All right. Other things, I think. Ah, yeah. So this is the last thing. Um, uh, again, this isn't really new. This is just an application of Lapatol, basically. Not even Lapatol for the first part, but uh, I want to prove this because you've probably been told this in class, and one should know why it's true. So there's this thing about rational functions, which you're often told at the beginning of a calculus class, but uh, never it's never justified to you, and I mean, I've said this several times, but if there is one single thing that you take away from our conversations together, it should be that whenever someone presents you with a claim in mathematics as in life, you should demand reasons and argument for it. And uh, in mathematics, the only trustworthy form of argument is mathematical proof. So if someone tells you that, hey, I had you two polynomials, one polynomial is called f, and he has order m, where m is some integer, m is in maybe z plus, and you know, maybe he has all these terms, and then I hand you a second polynomial g, this guy has order n, and his coefficients are named b, so b, n, x, n, and so forth, and I take the limit as x goes to infinity of the ratio of those two polynomials, f over g. So you're usually told a little trick that 
to figure out what happens, what is the end behavior, quote unquote, of this ratio or this rational function, you should just compare the order. So let's see whether m is bigger or n is bigger. Uh, so let's actually prove that. that. There's only three things that can happen when you take this limit. So case one, suppose m is bigger. So for instance, maybe f is cubic and g is linear or quadratic. So the top has bigger order. If the top has bigger order, then we can just do algebra where we divide every term in the top and bottom by x to the m. So I'm going to be a little lazy here and just pretend that this is the fraction here. This is the fraction f over g. And you can just imagine multiplying by 1 in the following very clever form. You multiply by 1 over x to the m over 1 over x to the m. And now you can just kind of see by i the algebra that happens when I distribute this. So I'm going to distribute this 1 over x to the m onto every term. And you see in the first one, I have am, the x to the m's cancel, so it's just a constant. For the second guy, x to the m minus 1 over x to the m is 1 over x, blah, 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 all the way down to a0. You get an a0 over x to the m. Same thing happens downstairs, except now I have to be careful because this is an n and this is an m. So the first term should be bn times x to the n over x to the m. But we can write that as bn over x to the m minus n. Right, this is just the negative exponent rule. Uh, that's not magic, but fine. Do that to each term. Same thing here, same thing here. And now we know how to take this limit. You don't even need La Fatale for this one. Uh, this is just a sum of these guys with negative powers of x in uh, multiplying some constants, or say positive powers of x in the denominators. So for instance, since m is bigger than n, this bn over x to the m minus n, that's b, bn over some positive power of x. And we proved before that for any positive power of x, limit as x goes to infinity, x to the n equals infinity, and by our lemma from the previous thing, that means similarly, limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over any positive power of x is 0. So using that result, which, okay, maybe I lied. I said you don't need L'Hopital's rule, but we needed L'Hopital, I think, to prove one of these, maybe. Um, actually, no, no, this was a direct proof. We didn't need L'Hopital, I'm lying. So even without L'Hopital, there is no excuse for high school calculus classes that choose not to prove this. You don't even need L'Hopital's rule. You could just do this with direct argument. So anyway, they all go to zero is the point. So everything goes to zero. Oh, uh, yeah, everything goes to zero. So this ends up being a limit which has a constant in the top and then something which I'm going to put quotes around here because I'm dividing by zero, but you see what I mean. It's a limit of something where the top tends to a constant and the bottom tends to zero. And again, we've proven that if you have something, this is the inverse of this statement, if you have something which tends to zero, then the limit of one over that something is going to be infinite. So uh, pretty simple. So right, you just, you know, if, if the guy in the top is bigger, divide out, and the quotient tends to infinity, where this, we mean this in the very precise sense that we defined it by four before, that for any n, I can find an m, so that when x is greater than m, this ratio is greater than n. OK, that's fine. That's just algebra. Second case, what if m is less than n? Right, so remember, m is the guy upstairs, so now we're saying that the degree of the denominator is larger than the degree of the numerator. So, okay, I'm not going to go through that whole spiel about multiplying by 1 over x to the n over 1 over x to the n again, but you can see what happens. We do that. Now we have all guys that tend to 0 upstairs, and then mostly guys who tend to 0, but then one constant from the leading term downstairs. So this goes like something which is going to 0 in the top and something which is going to be n in the bottom, which is 0. So good, okay, this also makes sense. If we have, say, a, a, a linear function over a cubic function, we expect this to go to zero because the bottom's getting big faster. Okay, last thing, really the only interesting thing, this uh, kind of case three, what if they're equal? What if the degree of the polynomial upstairs is the same as the degree of the polynomial downstairs? Well, I mean, you can probably see what's gonna happen. We just play the same game, divide top and bottom out, by x to the m, which is the same as x to the n, and make the same argument that, you know, this is a limit of a quotient, uh, you take the quotient of the limits, all of these guys go to zero, 
and the only surviving terms are the leading terms AM over BN, so it's the ratio of those leading terms that this fraction tends to. Okay, good, so I've skipped some steps, but I, I claim that we could actually uh, justify every step rigorously because we've proven all of these things, that these guys go to zero, and that uh, limits have this nice behavior when numerator and denominator do not go to zero. So this actually exhausts the three possible cases for the end behavior of a rational function. So, okay, thoughts on this little argument? Not on this argument specifically, but I'm curious what is preventing math teachers from prevent presenting proofs. Is uh, it like yeah. that presenting proofs is overly dependent on previous years? I mean, I mean, I don't have a good answer to that. Do you think it is? Like starting proofs this year, like in March, whenever we did, do you feel that being able to learn to prove things was somehow dependent on having taken a particular class like algebra? No. It did take a while. And I still have nowhere near mastered it. Well, it's fine. It's something it takes practice, but yeah, I think I agree. I don't think it depends on a particular class. Um, if I had to answer the question, why do high school math teachers not teach proofs? I think I would say the incentive structure is not aligned for them to do it, right? What, what are the incentives for teachers? Well, they want students to pass PSSAs or whatever standardized tests and cover the material that they have to from the textbook. And they certainly could present these proofs, but it would take time away from doing the grindy shit that you need to do to pass PSSAs and stuff, which determines you know the, the teacher's career safety, basically. So I would say that it's not the teacher's fault per se. It's kind of an institutional effect where you know there's a giant institutional momentum around standardized tests and things that incentivize teachers not to teach you to think, but just to teach you to calculate. But I don't know. Maybe that's not true in all cases. Maybe some teachers are also to blame themselves. Maybe they just don't understand how to prove things and wouldn't be able to teach it. I don't know what the answer is. So... I'm <laughs> laughing at the state of the American society right here because standardized testing is supposed to improve life for all. Well, I don't think anyone believes it does that. <laughs> well, no, it does not improve life for anyone. That is a lie. Yeah, I see the reasoning for it. Standardized tests are supposed to lower bound performance, right? Because if you, if you force every teacher, to, I mean, okay, so here's, here's math performance math performance. So, I mean, here's what would happen if you didn't learn anything. Here's what happens with standardized tests. And here's what's happened. No, uh, there's probably, maybe this is on a log scale, because I wouldn't have enough room on the screen to show the relative difference between the uh, positive externalities from being able to prove things. But here's what happens when you're able to prove things. And I think the reasoning people that make standardized tests have is that like, oh, well, if there were no standardized tests and we just left teachers to their own devices, maybe they wouldn't do anything, uh, nothing would happen. So they think they're moving you from here to here by forcing the teachers to at least get you to be able to pass standardized tests, right? They're lower bounding the quality. They're moving the lower bound from here up to here. But I think the problem is they're also upper bounding. I mean, if you make everyone pass standardized tests, you're probably putting a ceiling here that no one can pass because they don't have time to learn proofs, and they're kind of sadly preventing everyone from getting up here, which is, I think, the point of studying math is to learn how to think rigorously and evaluate arguments, which is valuable for being a productive human. But anyway, it's, I, should, I should stop ranting because I've heard this rant a lot of times now. Good. Other thoughts? I that it never gets boring. What do you say? Have you mentioned that your rants never get boring? Well, it's good to hear it. I feel like you're just flattering me at this point. So uh, I don't know if that's actually true. Okay, one more. Get two more slides. Yeah, it's an exercise. Is the last one. So you may have heard. Have, have you discussed slant asymptotes in your class yet? I believe it was mentioned, and I just didn't pay attention. Okay, good. Yeah, it's. I mean, I don't blame you. It's not that interesting, but. I mean, wh what does it mean? Um, well, we have a couple kinds of asymptotes we've discussed already. You can have, say, a vertical asymptote, like the tangent function, which 
blows up at a finite point, you can have a horizontal asymptote, whereas you run off to infinity, this guy goes to some number. But there's a third type of asymptote, which just looks like this, where the function is not linear. It has some more interesting behavior, like this guy's clearly not aligned because he's doing some kinky shit over here. But the limit as x goes to infinity of the function approaches a line. So it looks closer and closer to a line mx plus b, even though it's not that line elsewhere. So, okay, that's just a picture that doesn't, I mean, I haven't done anything. Uh, we have to actually define it if we want to prove things about it. So here's the definition. The graph of y equals f of x, a function f of x, has a slant asymptote along a given line, y equals mx plus b, where we assume m is non-zero, because otherwise it's just a horizontal asymptote, which we've already defined. We say it has that slant asymptote if the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x minus mx plus b in absolute value equals zero. So what does that limit mean pictorially? Well, I mean, it's kind of obvious. If the green line is the function and the blue line is this mx plus b thing that it's supposed to go to, then all our definition is saying is that you have the slant asymptote along this line if, as x gets larger and larger, the distance between your graph, the error, if you will, the error between your graph and this line tends to zero. So, fine. Okay, it's a pretty reasonable definition. So, okay, let's just, this is intentionally phrased as a kind of open-ended question, so you have to explore a little bit, but here's the question. Let f and g be polynomials. Find the conditions under which the rational function f of x over g of x has a slant asymptote. Or in other words, find what must be true, and say as much as you can, about f and g in order for this condition of having a slant asymptote to be true. Okay, so, hard question, but where do you think we should start? I believe that f is something along the lines of g multiplied by a constant. Why does that jet thing exist? f is g times a constant. Uh, well, that can't be true, because if f is g times a constant, then f over g is a constant, which would tend to a constant <laughs> as x goes to infinity, and we want it to tend to mx plus b. Good try, though. Okay, so it can't be a constant, but um, I think you're on the right track. So what do you think uh, the relationship should be if the limit is a line? Perhaps f of x is some, okay, these are still just thoughts, but perhaps some, perhaps f of x is some function composed with g of x, well, not composed, multiplied by g of x. f of x is h of x, g of x. Okay. Uh, h is some polynomial? Okay, so this could work. What kind of polynomial would h have to be if this is supposed to a give us this line? Linear slash binomial. Yeah, so this would have to be uh, a line, and my pen just died. Um, yep. Come on. Okay, yeah, so if h is a line, say mx plus b with m non-zero, and now you can see my pen is skipping again. mx plus b, there we go. This would work, so because this would have the property that f of x over g of x is a line mx plus b. So if this were true, then clearly just by algebra, then f of x over g of x, absolute value, minus mx plus b. Well, this is minus mx plus b in parentheses. This is exactly zero. So this condition would be satisfied, because clearly if I take the limit as x goes to infinity of both sides, on the right I get zero, so this thing works. Okay, so we found a class of solutions. The class is f is a linear multiple of g. Do we think this is all possible solutions, or are there others? It doesn't seem likely that this is... I think. So is our graph to the right some example of I'm just like saying for contrast, is this some example of our f of x over g of x. 
uh, yes, yeah, this could be, this function f on the right could be an example. Um, it's a somewhat exotic example because this guy has a place where, of course, g equals zero here. This guy has a place where g has a root, so one over a root gives you a pole, or sorry, the vertical asymptote. <laughs> I'm doing too much complex analysis. Uh, so yeah, so th this, this f is one, I shouldn't call it f. I should call this green line f over g, but indeed, this is an example. Thinking. So this means that I believe that my function, well, my idea does not account for all possible conditions because the f of x equals hg is always going to be linear when f is divided by g. Yes, yeah, so this is always linear, right. So we want to look for functions that f over g doesn't have to be linear, but it just has to be sort of approximately linear as you take the limit as x goes to infinity. Right. So what's an example? Let's just see if we could cook up one example that doesn't fit this mold. So here's one example. Um, f of x equals x squared plus 1, g of x equals x. So clearly this is not a linear multiple of g. I can't multiply g times some line like x y equals mx plus b, because if I did that I would get mx squared plus bx, but I would not get a constant. So this is not a linear multiple. Um, but limit as x goes to infinity of x squared plus 1 over x, uh, well, this guy blows up, but if I take the difference, right, because we're trying to subtract off some line, which is supposed to be the, the slant asymptote, if I subtract off the line x, then this would be the limit as x goes to infinity of, well, this is x squared plus 1 minus, multiply this guy by x over x, minus x squared over x, and the x squareds cancel, and this is limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x, which is 0. So it satisfies the definition, right, even though it's not a linear multiple. So can we see how to account for examples like this, where f is not a linear, an mx plus b multiple of g, but it still works out that the limit of their quotient minus some line is going to go to 0. I believe if g is some lower order polynomial, that might be the case. Let me think. Good. Yeah, I'm going to make some more room, but I think we're on the right track. So, so let's find if I don't know why I said lower order polynomial, if I meant lower degree polynomial. I think you can use either word, order or degree, both fine. Um, OK, yeah, so let's, let's find if we can say precisely how much lower the order has to be. So I'm just going to write the definition. Uh, this is the definition of slant asymptote, but um, now the function we're interested in is f over g rather than just f. Right, so limit as x goes to infinity, f of x over g of x minus mx plus b. We're looking for conditions, so I'm going to put a want over the equal sign. We want this to be 0. Okay, so what can we do on the left side to find something out about the relative orders of f and g? So I believe that if g is of a higher order than f, then there is no way that we can subtract a, li a line out. Yeah, good. And actually, we can prove that with what we saw a few slides ago. Because remember, we proved in n behavior that if the order of the bottom is bigger, so if you say, I should get rid of this thing. You said if the order of g is bigger than that of f, well, then we know that the ratio goes to 0, 
but we're not computing the ratio here, we're computing the ratio minus a line. So indeed, if the order of g is bigger, we have a huge problem, because this first guy is going to go to zero, but the second guy, mx, as x goes to infinity, that's going to go to infinity. So you're going to have a real tough time making that equal zero, if the order of g is bigger. Right, so we cannot have, so let's, I'm just going to start writing on the, the right side, the things we have figured out. So cannot have degree or order of g bigger than the degree of f. Good. First conclusion. What else? I also believe that we cannot have f's order equal to g's order, since that would simply be 1 over 1 minus some line equals 0. And that's only true at, like, one point. Yeah, true. Although this thing doesn't need to be 1 necessarily. It could be the ratio of their leading coefficients, right? A n over b n. But right. um, indeed, I agree that that's just a number. <laughs> and that number is going to get get swamped by this x as it's blowing up. So that can't work either. So can't have them equal. So we know the only remaining possibility is that the order of f has, has to be... Uh, bigger than the order of g, right? But can it be any larger order, or is it fixed to be a particular difference? Like, does the or difference in orders between f and b have to be like 1 or 2 or 3? Can we pin down the difference precisely? Well, I, I'm i almost intentionally avoiding the answer here, but um, we see that if f is two degree higher than g, then we are going to have some thinking, some quadratic minus a line, and I believe that is only equal to zero at two points, and one of that, well, it would be interesting if one of those points was infinity. Actually, that would require a slope of zero for, well, I say derivative slope in quotation marks. Yeah, you say if f is quadratic, uh, or sorry, if f is too higher in degree than g, then this thing is a limit of a quadratic minus a line. But we know that uh, as x gets large, the quadratic is going to completely swamp the line. And unless the slope, quote unquote, or the coefficient in front of the x squared is zero, which would contradict the original assumption, then this thing would blow up and it wouldn't go to zero. So it seems like we also can't have degree of f equals degree of g plus 2. It can't be 2 greater. And I think that argument applies for any any higher, right? If f is 3 higher, then you're going to get cubic minus line, which is going to blow up. So it looks like there's only one option. What's the one option? I believe that the only option is for when the degree of f is the degree of g plus 1. I think that's right. Degree of g plus 1. Good. So we've, we've gotten to the right answer. And now that we see what we want to prove, uh, it, might, it might be a little easier to do the formal manipulation. So the way to do that, since we're trying to roughly argue that only if the degree of f is one larger than the degree of g, will this guy end up like a line? so that line minus line can be something which tends to zero. So the way to do that, or to argue that algebraically, is to get a common denominator between these two, so we can compare uh, you know, the line contribution to the g contribution, so to speak. So if you do that, you'll get f of x minus, well, getting a common denominator gives us the quantity mx plus b times g of x, over g of x. Now here's the trick. This is, again, a quotient of two polynomials, right? If I take a line times a polynomial, I get another polynomial. So this is a limit, as x goes to infinity, of polynomial over polynomial, even though those two polynomials look kind of more complicated now, because there's a sum in the top. But we proved before, well, roughly proved, I argued, didn't really go through all the details, but we proved that the only way that a quotient of polynomials can go to zero is if the order of the bottom is bigger than the order of the top. So we need the order of g 
to be bigger than the order of this junk in the top. But now we're in trouble, unless there's a very specific condition. Because how can the order of g be bigger than the top when the top has g times x, right? If you have g times x, that's going to have a bigger order than g. So it seems like in general we're screwed, because you're going to get g times x in the top, that's going to have a bigger order than g in the bottom. So how do you get the order of the bottom to be bigger than the order of the top? Well, the only way that could work is if there's a cancellation, right? If one of the terms of f, actually two of them, right? If the first two terms of f cancel with the first leading terms of x times g. Why must that be true? Because, well, okay, so if, I'll write this out more cleanly on the next slide, but if g of x has some leading term a n x to the n plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 and you go down to whatever then this guy this mx I'm going to drop the b for a moment but the mx g is going to be like m a n x to the n plus 1 and an m a n minus 1 x to the n we better kill these two terms right because we want, at the end of the day, the bottom to have higher order than the top. The bottom has order n, right? I wrote it right here, a n x to the n. So if the bottom has to have higher order than the top, we better kill off these two terms, because this guy has higher order than the bottom, and this guy has the same order as the bottom. And the only way we can cancel those two terms off is if f contributes the cancellation. So f has to contribute a minus m a n x to the n plus 1 and a minus m a n minus 1 x to the n. f has to contribute that, those terms to cancel so that when we add these together we kill off the higher order terms and we're left with only terms that are subleading, that are lower in degree compared to the bottom. But that's actually almost the proof because if f contributes these two terms and nothing beyond that then that means f just looking at the number here, f is of order n plus 1, or degree n plus 1. So, I mean, this is kind of a sloppy algebra argument, I'll write it out neatly as I said on the next slide, but the punchline of this whole argument of getting a common denominator was that this precise cancellation only works out if the degree of g is n and the degree of f is n plus 1, which means indeed we must have degree of f one larger than the degree of g. Okay kind of hand-waving argument, but uh, thoughts or questions and or does that make sense? I have no thoughts or questions, it makes sense. Okay, good. Let's just see it one more time since I was a bit hand-wavy, but... Um, okay, so here's the comment. I should have put absolute values around this app actually, but it doesn't really matter. Um, if it goes, if the, if the limit goes to zero, it goes to zero in absolute value, of course, so... Um, okay, so this is the common denominator. As I say, the limit will only be zero if the degree of the bottom, g, is greater than the degree of the top. In math, that means this degree of g uh, must be greater than the degree of the sum of these two terms. The first term is f of x, the second is minus g of x times mx plus b. We've assumed the slope is non-zero. Therefore, the degree of g times mx plus b is one greater than the degree of g, right? Because I multiply and I pick up a new x. The only way, as I argued, to get a smaller degree in the numerator than in the denominator is if the two leading terms cancel with f. So just to put a bit more math on that, if f is this polynomial with coefficients whose names are a, a n, a n minus 1, and so forth, and g is this polynomial with coefficients b, b n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, and so forth, so I've chosen that, I've chosen that they differ by 1, and I'm going to prove that this works. If they work, then in order to get this cancellation to happen, we can solve for the needed values of m and b. We need m to be a n over b, whoops, typo, n minus 1, because then multiplying g times mx is going to contribute a term, since m is this ratio, we get a term where this cancels the denominator of the m, and I get an a n x n, which cancels the f. Similarly, b Maybe I shouldn't have used the letter b twice for both coefficients and for the intercept, but whatever. 
B must be this, because then when I multiply G by B, there's a B n minus 1 here, which will cancel the leading B n minus 1 here. I'll get an A n minus 1, which is going to cancel the A n minus 1 x n minus 1 in F, and so forth. So uh, this is the argument that it works. Works if degree of F is one larger than degree of G. We've already kind of argued it couldn't work if it's smaller, and it couldn't work if it's larger than this, because then you would have, say, an xn minus n plus 2 or whatever, some larger factor upstairs, uh, which would blow up as x goes to infinity. Okay, so the, the punchline is that you get, after all of this argument, you get slant asymptotes if and only if, can only happen in one case, if and only if you're taking a limit that looks like limit x goes to infinity of a n x to the n, uh, it's not plus one, uh, a n x to the n plus junk over b n x to the n minus one, maybe I should make that n minus one plus junk. So you get slants only if they differ by one. That's the punchline. Um, okay, good. So you probably mentioned this in your class, but I, I think it's good to, to prove the conditions under which they exist. So now that I think of it, I do not believe that slant asymptotes were talked about, but I recognize, well, I recognize the word and I am more comfortable with the idea now. Oh, so it wasn't even mentioned and you didn't pay attention. It was just like never discussed. And it may have been mentioned and I was not paying attention or something. Doesn't seem like a thing that they would mention. But there were certainly no homework problems on it, you're saying? Correct. Yeah, it's probably a mistake. I mean, if you talk about something and then don't assign problems on it, then people just ignore it. So. <laughs> you mean those, what is it, 18 chapters that I haven't got any questions related to the story on? 18 chapters of Huck Finn? I, well, you're at six today, so the other 12 you did before? Yeah. Right. And none of the multiple choice things have had anything to do